If you don't know me, my name is Zan. Um, I'm one of the elders here. I'm here to share a message with you this morning. We are in week three of our four-week series on uh, Jonah. And uh, next week, Travis will be coming back to wrap up the series. We were in an elder meeting on uh, Monday, and Travis thanked Dylan and Stacy for the wonderful jobs that they had done in the past two weeks. And then he turned to me and he said, okay, Zan, don't blow it. So... <laughs> So whatever happens here, just tell him I did fine. And Dave, if you could find like a Tim Keller sermon to put up online. We're, okay. All right. Great. So now that that's covered, um, let's do a quick recap of our series so far. Two weeks ago, Jonah took us, Dylan took us through Jonah 1. And uh, we saw here that there was a call from God to Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach. Jonah said, no way. He ran off in the opposite direction on a ship to Tarshish. God sent a storm. He pursued Jonah. Jonah was cast overboard and swallowed by a fish. Last week, Stacy took us through chapter 2 of Jonah, which is Jonah's time inside the fish, and we saw that was a time of surrender and acknowledgement for Jonah, the knowledge of God moving from his head to his heart. And at the end of the chapter, Jonah is spit back out onto dry land, and that's where we pick up today. So the, the title of our sermon today is Unlikely, and the reason for that is that when Travis, a couple weeks ago, asked me to preach this morning, that's what I told him. But here we are. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Jonah 3, which is kind of difficult. It's a very short book, and it actually moves around. Last week when Stacy was preaching, I found it in the New Testament, but it's near the Old, in the Old Testament this morning, between Micah and Obadiah, which are also very small books, so good luck. We'll have the words on the screen as well. So most of what we'll be talking about this morning in Jonah 3 is about how God wants to use us in the lives of people around us who don't know him. So what is our attitude towards being light to our non-believing friends, our non-believing family, and drawing people towards God? And as I'm up here talking about this, please don't think that I'm up here because I've got this all figured out. I struggle with this every day. So preparing this message has been a challenge for me. I hope it's challenging for you too, and I hope it's an, it's an encouragement as well. So Jonah 3 starts off with God calling Jonah in a way that mirrors the calling in chapter 1. So let's look at the first two verses to start. Verse 1 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, the message that I tell you. So what we see here is that God, God really wanted to use Jonah. God was calling Jonah again. There was a mission field of Nineveh that needed a prophet, and God, he's God. He could have used anybody, but he wanted to use Jonah. He didn't need him, but he wanted him. So to, to flush that out a little bit more, we're going to look at another story in the Old Testament and that's the story of Esther. And some context around this story is that um, at this time, the Persians were ruling over the nation of Israel. So the, the Jews were subject to the Persians. And through kind of an odd series of events, a Jewish woman named Esther actually becomes the queen of Persia. And at the same time, someone else in the kingdom comes up with this plot to kill all of the Jews throughout the Persian Empire. Now, the Queen Esther, she has an uncle named Mordecai. He finds out about this plot, and he sends a message to her, and he asks her to intercede with the king on behalf of the nation of Israel. And what he says to her, and this will be on your screen, and in Esther 4, verse 14, he says, If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So he's saying, God has put you here for this very reason. God has made Esther queen because he wanted to use her to save the Jews from annihilation. But he doesn't need her. If Esther remains silent, God is not going to be stumped. He's going to find another way. And the one who loses out is actually Esther. And it's exactly the same here with Jonah. God decides that he wants to use Jonah, but if Jonah refused, God isn't desperate. God pursued Jonah for Jonah's sake. 
As we look back at chapter 1, when, when Jonah was fleeing, God was not thinking, oh shoot, there goes my only chance to speak to Nineveh. He's, he's fleeing in a ship to Tarshish. No, God could have just let Jonah go and done something else. But he wanted to use Jonah. He pursued Jonah for Jonah's sake. And in the same way, God has put each of you in places, in relationships, for such a time as this. God wants to use you to bring people to him, but God does not need you. So our reaction to this, that God doesn't need me, it shouldn't be, oh, phew, God's got a plan B, I'm off the hook. We can ask Jonah how that went. But instead, I think we need to consider how amazing it is that even though God doesn't need me, he wants to use me, he wants to use you. So think of this, if you've ever had an experience where you felt that God was calling you to something and it was kind of scary, you weren't sure about it, but you stepped out and did it, looking back on those times, your perspective is usually, what, oh, I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad I did that because you got to experience something that you would have missed out on otherwise. So when God is calling you to something, it's not just about the need that he's calling you to. I think that's what we focus on almost exclusively, but it's not just about that need. God is just as much focused on the process. He's just as much focused on you and what he wants to do in you through that process. He wants you to be a part of his plan for the people in your life, and that's actually for you. That's for you. If the only point of the book of Jonah was that God needed to send a prophet to Nineveh, then this would have been a one-chapter book. Chapter 3 is the only chapter that's really dedicated to Nineveh. But instead, we get four chapters, and three of them are dedicated to God pursuing Jonah and God's relationship with Jonah, because that's important to God. God wanted us to know about this. That's why it's in Scripture. So he wanted to make himself known to Jonah just as much as Nineveh, Let me tell you a little story. When I worked for the Navigators uh, back years ago, it's a Christian uh, ministry, uh, we would have these conferences or meetings every once in a while, and inevitably, at some point during the weekend or during the day, there'd be a time where someone got up in front and they start showing pictures and they start telling stories. And they would go like this. Back 30, 40, 60 years ago, some of these pictures were in black and white almost. God decided to use this person named Joe. I'm going to make all these names up. Joe was at school at this university, and God decided he wanted to use Joe, so Joe led his roommate, Tim, to Christ. And then Joe and Tim, they started a Bible study together, and through that Bible study, Greg came to know Jesus. And Greg was in the military, then he went overseas, and he met David, and David also got to know Jesus. And then David and his wife, Tina, they had a family, and they started this ministry in this city, and on and on these stories would go about these relationships and God bearing fruit for the kingdom for these relationships. And the coolest part is as I'm sitting in that room and I'm looking at these pictures and and hearing these stories, some of those same people were in that room, much older, but they're looking back at these pictures, they're hearing these stories of how God had used them, about the lives that they had touched, about the people who had gotten to know Jesus because of, what God, because of how God used them. And they got to see the story that God was writing, that they were a part of. And, and as I'm sitting there and, and listening to this and watching these pictures, I'm thinking, man, I want to be a part of a story like that. I want to leave a legacy like that. Not so I could boast about what I did or about you know, who's in the kingdom because of me, but because I want to experience firsthand the ways that God moves. So I could tell my friends about it, so I could tell my church, my grandkids about it. And the amazing thing is that God wants that for you. He wanted to use Esther. He wanted to use Jonah. He wants to use me. And he wants to use you because he doesn't want you to miss out. God doesn't need you, but God doesn't want you to miss out. So this call for Jonah to go preach to Nineveh, it's for Nineveh, but it's also for Jonah. And Jonah really blew it. Chapter one, he hears the call, he gets up and runs away. He says, God, I want nothing to do with this. Have you ever felt like that? You heard the call of God and you blew it. God was leading you in some way. You just didn't measure up. Maybe you tried, you couldn't do it, or maybe you didn't even try. Maybe just like Jonah, you said, God, I don't want to. 
I've been there before plenty of times. I've said, God, I'd just rather not. But the amazing thing is that God doesn't only forgive us for that sin, but he still wants to use us. He still wants to use us. If you're like me, you can, you can carry that failure with you. You can carry that with you and think that, well, God can't use me. God doesn't want to use me because I've let him down before or I keep letting him down. So we can let our past failures cripple us. We can let our failures sideline us because we think that I've blown it or I can't do it or God can't trust me because that's the way that it is out there. But the truth is that God is in the business of using broken people, messed up people. That is all throughout scripture. It's all throughout my story, probably your story too, that God uses broken and messed up people. Now in scripture, there's no better example of this, I think, than Peter. So Peter, the disciple of Jesus, right before Jesus was crucified, Peter denied him three times. When the temperature gets turned up, Peter three times says, oh, I don't, I don't know him. So you might think that this would disqualify Peter from, from future service, that, that now that that's on his resume, he's no good anymore. But Jesus later says to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. And that's exactly what he does. So we see this all throughout scripture so many times, all throughout our stories, God using people, not even just in spite of, but through their failures, through their weaknesses. As if, if God only gave us one chance, I would not be up here. Travis wouldn't be a pastor, and Russ, oh, Russ. <laughs> no, you might be okay. So if you're thinking, if you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, and I think some of you really need to hear this, that God, there are better people out there for you to use, better people than me, more effective people than me. I'm, I've proven that I'm no good. I don't work, and, and I struggle with this so much, but God isn't getting that message. He does, he's not going to let that stop him from using you because he's in the business of using broken people and messed up people and Russ. So Jonah gets the call. He blows it. God does not move on to his next option. Instead, he pursues Jonah through chapter 1, through chapter 2, and here we get to this place of God calling Jonah again at the beginning of chapter 3, and this time Jonah goes, and we get to Nineveh. So Nineveh, I would say, is, is unlikely, just like God's choice of using Jonah. Nineveh is unlikely. Nineveh was the Assyrian capital, was the largest city in the world at the time. And if you read through the Old Testament, the Assyrians, they were not friends of Israel. In fact, they were enemies. So if you picture a place that's far from God, Nineveh really fits that picture. So the question is, why these people? They were enemies of Israel. Why would God even want to send a prophet there? And they were disobedient to God. No way they're even going to listen to a prophet. My take on this would be, God, you're having a hard enough time with your own people. You think Nineveh's going to listen to you? That's a place that is far from God. So to look at that, uh, we're going to hop over to Ephesians, which is a letter in the New Testament. And here, Paul is writing to a church of Gentile believers, um, so Christians who came from a pagan background instead of a Jewish background. And Paul is addressing one of the biggest issues that the early church faced, and that was that there was a division between Jews who followed Jesus and Gentiles who followed Jesus. So let's read in Ephesians 2, starting in verse 12. Paul says, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. 
For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So Paul here is talking about these two groups. There are the Jews, the Israel, Israelites, God's chosen nation, God's people throughout the whole Old Testament. They're near to God. And then there's the Gentiles, the enemies of Israel throughout the Old Testament. They're far from God. So we have the Jews who are near, Gentiles who are far off, both groups in need of a Savior, both in need of Jesus, in need of God's grace. So Paul says to the Ephesian church, yes, you were far off from God. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel. You were alienated from God's covenant. But there's always a but in Scripture. You who were far off have now been brought near. Jesus came to bring peace to those who were near, the Jews, and peace to those who were far away. And now there's no longer separation. There's no longer distance. Together, they are the household of God. Because when Jesus is in the picture, that distance from God is, is irrelevant. Far, far from God does not matter. So let me give you another example. I grew up going to church. I was a, a pretty good kid. I listened to my parents I didn't know Jesus when I was in high school, but I think if you knew me back then and someone had told you, yeah, he'll be a believer, he'll be a Christian, he's going to you know, be an elder at his church and preach a sermon on Sunday, you might have said, yeah, I could see it. It's not surprising. Now let me tell you about the pastor of the church that I was a part of down in Maryland. He was a gangster and a drug dealer in Northeast D.C., this is before he was a pastor. He had a career change. But he was, on, he was on trial because he had fired his gun into a crowd. And he was facing, I think it was 40 years in prison. And that was when God got a hold of his life, turned his life around. And now he leads an incredible church down in Riverdale, Maryland. So the point is, if you had known him when he was a young man back in his heyday, and someone had told you, yeah, he's going to be a pastor. He's going he's gonna to lead a church and do incredible things for the kingdom. I probably would have said, no way, not him. He's too far from God. But that distance doesn't matter one bit because Jesus came for those who were near and he came for those who were far off. But I think we, we can be so skeptical of that. Let me give you another example from Scripture. Paul. Paul was a violent persecutor of the early church before he became a Christian. He was hunting down Christians. He was throwing them in prison. He participated in, in the stoning of Stephen, the first deacon. But God gets a hold of him. God gets a hold of him, turns his life around. And after he's converted, the first person that he meets is a disciple named Ananias. And Ananias is skeptical. When he meets Paul, he says to God, this guy, don't you know who this guy is? Haven't you heard what he's done? Essentially, don't you know how far from God this guy is? But God goes on to use Paul to evangelize most of the known world at the time and write most of the New Testament. So if you're like me, there may be people in your life that you consider near to God. I'm like, yeah, I, I could see it. It wouldn't be surprising. And people you might consider far from God. No way God's going to reach that person. They're too far. But the truth is, when anyone is forgiven of their sin, when anyone is reborn to new life in Christ through the Holy Spirit, that is nothing short of a miracle. It's, it's the work of God. So for us to say, yeah, I could see that happening here, but this guy probably not, no way. It's, it's just, it's silly. It's silly when you think of it. And I bet that some of you, maybe all of you, you know someone who seemed far from God, that you never thought God would reach that person. And then you got a phone call and, and you got a text message and you were like, really? Him? Maybe you're that person. Maybe, maybe you're sitting here in church this morning and nobody thought that you'd ever be here. But God has moved. Just like the, the father of the prodigal son who got up and ran, got up and ran, God covers that distance. So far off from God does not matter. I bet all of us have people in our lives right now who seem unlikely, who seem far from God, just like Nineveh, just like Paul, just like my old pastor Kurt in Maryland. And we need to remember that for people who seem near, people who seem far, everyone is in need of Jesus, 
No one is beyond the reach of Jesus. Everyone is in need. No one is beyond his reach. So we can look at Jonah and say, don't rule out God using you. We can look at Nineveh and say, don't rule out God reaching that person who seems far from him. Even though neither Jonah or Nineveh really makes sense from our perspective, this is how God works. He's the same God back then as he is now. And this is how he is. So we've got an unlikely messenger, we've got an unlikely mission field, and we've made it through the first two verses. So let's keep going, pick up in uh, verse 3, and we'll, we'll pick up the pace a little bit. So verse 3 says, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So we see Nineveh is a big, big city. It takes three days just to get across, and Jonah starts in. So sometimes when I read a story in Scripture, I like to picture that scene. I like to picture it in my head to help me understand it better. So Scripture doesn't um, often very give, give, give very much detail. We kind of sometimes get the bare bones. Um, this happened and that happened. So I kind of like to use my imagination to kind of fill it in a little bit. So what did it look like? What did it sound like? What would it have been like to be there? And, and sometimes that helps me understand a bit better what's going on. So let me paint this scene for you how I imagine it. Let's say that you are a merchant on the street in Nineveh. It's another busy day in the capital of Assyria. Everyone's running this way, that way. They've got things to do. And let's say you're finishing up with a customer at your hot dog stand, and then you, you notice this, this smell, this kind of awful, overwhelming smell. It kind of smells like fish, but the fish guy doesn't come on Wednesdays. And then you notice there's this guy walking down the street, and he's shouting something, but you can't, you can't hear him yet. And you see his clothes are tattered. He's got something hanging from his shoulder. It's, it's seaweed. It's weird. And he's shouting, and as he's getting closer, you can start to make out what he's saying. He's saying, 40 days, 40 days, and Nineveh will be overturned. And he keeps walking, he keeps shouting. So let's stop there for a second. What is your response to that? How would you respond? He's crazy, right? I'm picturing, I'm picturing everyone's just kind of staring, heads are turning as he's walking down the street, and everyone's staring at him, but nobody's making eye contact. So when we picture it like this, we can kind of see just how bizarre this, really, this story really is. And we can see just how surprising the response of the Ninevites was. The next verse, though, Jonah 3.5 says, The people of Jonah believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. So they don't ignore Jonah like we'd expect. They don't pelt him with tomatoes, they don't call the cops. Instead, they listen to Jonah's message and they believe. Scripture says that every single one of them, from the least to the greatest, believed Jonah's message and repented. So when we picture this, this crazy fish man walking down the street, shouting about Nineveh's destruction, the way that this actually happened was every single person on that street stopped and they listened they believed and they repented. Isn't that absurd? Can you actually picture that happening? And it doesn't even stop there. The word starts spreading. As, as far as we can tell uh, in Scripture, this, is, this part isn't quite clear, but it, it takes three days to get across the city. But Jonah isn't even through the first day, and word has already reached the king. So, so what can we make of this response here? Well, Travis has defined witnessing as joining the conversations that God is already having with people. So he's not here this morning, so I said that. It's joining the conversations that God is already having with people. So I, I used to picture witnessing or evangelism as, as God saying to me, go to that person, tell them about me, and then come back and let me know how it goes. But as I think about my own testimony, how I came to know Jesus, and really, every story, every testimony that I've heard, every time, it's a conversation with God. 
And in that conversation, God invites other people. He uses other people to move that forward. There are a number of people who have played a pivotal role in my salvation, people who read scripture with me, people who, who spoke truth into my life. And I bet a lot of you have a pretty similar story. Maybe it was one person, maybe it was a few people, maybe it was a fast process or over a couple years, but I think if, if you think back over your story and the stories of people you know, I think you'll see it was God who started that process, who engineered that process. It was God who used people in my life as part of that conversation with him to win over my soul. So if there's someone who's been there for you, maybe there was uh, someone who's at some crucial time, they spoke this crucial truth into your life that you needed to hear right then. That's not a coincidence, and it probably wasn't that person's idea. Instead, God used that person to step into the conversation at the right time with the right thing to say. And if that person had spoken at any other time or said anything else, or if anyone else had spoken those words, it probably would have been meaningless. But right at that time, it was what you needed to hear. And that person probably had no idea the full impact of, of what they said, their words. They were just listening to God and they were following his lead. And I think that's exactly what we see here as Jonah walks into Nineveh. Let's think about how unlikely this response is that they hear this prophet and everyone, every single person on that street stops and believes and repents. The only way this happens is that God was already working in Nineveh. God was already at work there. He had already begun that conversation with the Ninevites and was already working on their hearts. So when Jonah steps in on that first day to Nineveh, that's not the beginning of the story for the Ninevites. That's the, the climax of the story when they repent and believe. God brings Jonah in at the right time with the right message. It hits right where it needs to and it clicks for every single person in Nineveh and it brings repentance. So I've been challenged to think about the people in my life in those same terms, that God is already having a conversation with them. God is already having a conversation with them. God is already at work. And this, when I think about it this way, this is, this is incredibly freeing because what it means is that I'm not the architect of anyone's salvation. I am not in charge of anyone else's salvation. And this is good because I don't think it would go well if I was. But I think that's really important for us to grasp. Because if, if God has laid someone on your heart, if God has put someone on your heart, that means that you're not in charge of that person's salvation. God has put that person on your heart because he is in charge of that person's salvation. And he wants to bring you into that conversation. He wants you to play a role in that process. So it's freeing, but it's also incredibly challenging because it means that we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention and listen to what conversations God is having around me in the lives of people around me. So if, if you've ever been in a conversation or maybe a meeting and you're kind of zoning out, not really paying attention, and suddenly you hear your name and everyone's staring at you, has that happened? Okay, it happened to me too plenty of times. So maybe you've been part of a conversation and someone else comes up and just barges in with something completely unrelated and it derails the entire conversation. That's, that's happened too. I think when we think about it this way, if we're going to play a role in the conversations that God is having with people around you, we need to pay attention. We need to listen to what that conversation is. If I decide that I'm in charge of someone else's salvation, I may very well be that person barging in and derailing the conversation that's already happening. Or if I'm not listening, if I'm not paying attention, I'm gonna have no idea what's going on with that person. I'm gonna have no idea what God is already doing in that person's life. And I'm gonna miss out on opportunities to participate. So going back to, to these unlikely people, these faraway people, my oldest brother is, is a self-professed atheist, still is. Um, but I found out a couple years back from, from someone that I knew, like a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend and so on, that at one point my brother had actually participated in a Bible study with, with some guys from work. One, one guy from his work was a believer and my brother went to this Bible study. And my, my first reaction was surprise. Well, I didn't know about that. I thought I was supposed to be in charge of stuff like that. <laughs> 
But no, God was doing stuff in my brother's life that I had no idea about. There were other things going on. God was moving because he's, he's in charge. And my brother isn't in the kingdom yet, but I believe that God has a process that he is working. He is moving forward. He is using people. Maybe it's not even me. Maybe it's other people that I have no idea. Maybe it is me. We have, we have roles to play in this process that God is in charge of and God is inviting us to. So if we're not taking the time to listen, we don't know what God may be saying to the people in our lives. And, and God may not tell us the whole conversation. God may just tell us just enough to take part. All that Jonah heard was go to Nineveh and preach there. But because of that, he got to see an entire city bow before God because of the words that God gave him. So how do we listen to those conversations that God is having? How do we participate in them? That's a really big question, and we're not going to cover it here this morning. If you want to find out more about that, join a small group. Join our, our growth track. We've got base camp coming up again soon. This is really, discipleship is what, it's at the heart of what we do here at Summit, and we have lots of opportunities. If you want to learn, there are opportunities, and we, we want to engage in that. So that, that question goes beyond the sermon this morning, but there is one really important perspective that I do want to share. And to do that, we're going to take a look at another story in the Old Testament, and that's the story of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah is an Old Testament hero. And what, what is he known for? What did he do? Someone shout it out. He built the wall. Nehemiah was the guy who built the wall. So I think the most important part of the story of Nehemiah is the very beginning of the first chapter. So let's take a look there. We'll read through the first couple verses. There are a couple funky names here, so just bear with me. In chapter 1, starting in verse 1, it says, The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah. Now as it happened in the month of Chislev, in the twentieth year, as I was in Susa the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And the rest of the chapter gets into the actual prayer that Nehemiah says before God. So Nehemiah, he's the king's cupbearer. He's in the king's court. And he, these guys come in, and they tell the state that Jerusalem is in. It's broken down. It's survivor, the wall is broken down. Its survivors are in trouble. And Nehemiah is just heartbroken. He mourns. He fasts. And he prays for days. But before he does anything else, before he does anything else, he prays. He pleads for Jerusalem. And it's from there that God sends him and uses him to rebuild the wall. Out of everything that Nehemiah did, there are 13 chapters in the book of Nehemiah, I think the most important thing he did was pray because he acknowledged that it wasn't up to him to save Jerusalem. He knew that it was in God's hands and it was God who was going to be the guy who built the wall. Nehemiah was the guy who prayed and then God used him to build the wall. Everything that he did stemmed from that time that he spent on his knees, on his knees pleading with God for that city. And as a result of that, God had somebody that he could use. God had somebody who was listening. God had somebody who was there with him. So as we think of other people in our lives, the people that God has put in front of you, I think we need to have that perspective that I'm not in charge of anyone's salvation. God is in charge of everyone's salvation. That is in God's hands. And because of that, the most powerful thing that I can do for that person, that you can do for that person that God has put on your heart, is hit your knees before the Lord and pray for them. And that is going to put you in a position where God can use you, where he can bring you into that conversation because you and God have connected about that person. So to recap what we've covered so far, God wanted to use Jonah for Jonah's sake. He was an unlikely prophet, an unlikely mission field, 
an unlikely response happened because of the conversation that God was already having with the Ninevites. So I've got one more point that, that we want to cover here, and that's in the second half of the chapter. So let's take a look at the rest of Jonah 3. So picking back up in verse 6, it says, The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So, so this last point, it's not as closely tied to everything else that we've covered so far this morning, but I think it's really important. So when I read through the Old Testament, I like to look for ways that it points forward to Jesus, because we know that all of Scripture in the Old Testament is leading up to Jesus. So the question here is, what is the gospel according to Jonah? And I think we see it here in the king's response and in God's decision to have mercy on Nineveh. So to, to look at that more, we're going to go back to Ephesians, and we're going to read a couple verses from the beginning of chapter 2. So these will be on, your, on the screen as well. So Nehemiah, or sorry, Ephesians 2 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So here we have a description of, really it fits anybody. It's of the Ephesian church before they knew Jesus, but it fits anybody before the grace of God. Paul says they were dead in their trespasses and sins, that they were carrying out the desires of their body and minds, and they were children of wrath. This describes Nineveh. This describes the Ephesian church. describes you and me before, before the grace of God. So the problem here, the problem that the Ephesian church had was that their ways were displeasing. Their ways were offensive to God. And because of that, they were children of wrath, deserving of God's wrath. So what we need to see here, what's in Scripture here, is that the solution, the answer to this problem, is not for them to change their ways. If our ways are displeasing to God, the solution is not to change our ways. The solution is not to become more pleasing to God. The solution is but God, but God being rich in mercy, loved us when we were sinners and made us alive with Jesus even when we were dead in our sins. Now, the whole second half of the book, it gets into how do we change our ways in response to this, but I think we need to understand that changing our ways is the response, it's not the solution. It's not the answer. The, the, the mechanism for my salvation, for my relationship with God, is not me making my ways more pleasing to God. The mechanism is God's grace shown through Jesus. It's not me fixing my ways. And I think we fall into this trap even as Christians that if there's, if there's something in my life that's not pleasing to God, that the solution is to change my ways and that's going to fix my relationship with God, that's important, but that's not the answer. We have to get there. We've got to get there, but the, we're missing the point if we think, if we skip over the fact that God loved us as sinners and made us alive in Jesus while we were dead in our sins. Jerry Bridges, he's an author, he talks about the importance of preaching the gospel to ourselves every day. I love that phrase. If you want to learn more about it, join a small group. That's all I'll say about that. 
But we see this at the end of Jonah 3, that the king sends a proclamation throughout the entire city, and, and it, doesn't, it, it includes a call for everyone to change their ways. But the king knows that that's not the solution. That's not the answer to their problem. It doesn't fix the impending destruction of Nineveh. He knows that giving up their evil ways doesn't fix their relationship with God. It doesn't remove their guilt. So what he says is, everyone call out to God, and who knows, who knows? God may turn from his fierce anger. He knows that no matter what they do, they are at God's mercy. They need a solution that comes from God and not from them. And what happens? God is rich in mercy. He sees their hearts turning towards him, and he has mercy on, him, on them. So thank God that we have, we've got a God who has that solution, that we can't fix our ways before God. We can't make ourselves more pleasing to God, but God fixes that problem. It's always the but God in Scripture. Whenever you see that in Scripture, pay attention. But God was rich in mercy, made us alive when we were dead in our sins.